Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome to Chicago from Queens, Mrs. Shandel Symes, who is joining us this evening for a special opportunity for us to get to meet the author of an extraordinary book. And for many of us here in Chicago, especially in Skokie, to connect to someone with whom we had a Kesher over many years in different ways through a mutual family connection, you could say, here in the Chicago area that connected us to the Symes family, which is kind of the origins of this magnificent book. For those who have not gotten a chance to pick it up yet, it's called Rolling Rabbi, The Power of Perseverance, the story of Rabbi Yehuda Symes, authored by our very own guest tonight, Mrs. Shandel Symes. So Mrs. Symes is joining us from New York, and this recently published book tells the story of her life, of the life of her late husband, Rabbi Yehuda Symes, Zecher Tzadik Lavracha, and their family as they went through an exceptionally challenging and trying journey, uh, primarily, we could say, in Ottawa, in Canada, but it certainly has many connections here in the United States to the family in Chicago and to her family in New York, where she currently resides. So we thank you so much for taking the time, for sharing the inspiration, for opening your heart with us through this magnificent book and also through the evening tonight. So welcome and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm really, really happy to be here. It gives me chizuk, it gives me strength to share my story and to know that my story has meaning and a special shout out to my sister-in-law and brother-in-law in Skokie. Right here in Skokie, <laughs> Illinois. So maybe take us back a little bit. Uh, we actually connected over a year ago when you were working on this book. This book is a story. And it's a story with many woven layers and elements between diary pieces and reflections and things that were written at the time. But what is the general narrative for those who are not familiar with uh, Rav Yehuda Zecher Tzadik Lavracha and his story? Maybe just give us in a moment uh, the narrative that on the one hand begins in an evening and a terrible, fateful moment, but really began before that with your family. So maybe catch us up just a little bit for those who aren't yet familiar. Okay, so my husband Yehuda grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, he was the youngest of four children, three sisters, and his parents were very instrumental in the city of St. Paul. They were very um, involved in the Judaic aspects of the community, making sure that there was infrastructure. They were involved with the mikvah, the Chavra Kadisha, the, the day school, um, having minyanim in their home, opening up a vishul once they outgrew the minyan in their home, um, my father-in-law would go around to different people to blow the show for those who were unable to come. He would personally drive people to shul that were unable to, not during, um, during the week, obviously, who were not able to make it to shul. And part of the reason of having the shul in their home was for people who were not able to walk the way to another shul. And they had a matzah factory at one point in their home. Just, they were quiet people. Um, I never had the you know, the honor, the privilege of really knowing them very well. My mother-in-law passed away before I was married and my father-in-law shortly after. So, um, but from what I hear that in their own quiet way, they really, really were instrumental in growing their community. And that was the background and the backbone of how Yehuda was raised, that you are a force in the community and you are there to help others and you are there to facilitate and to perpetuate Jewish life in your community. Um, with that teaching in place, he um, was enrolled in ninth grade at WITS for, in Milwaukee for Chafetz Chaim High School. And again, as part of the Chafetz Chaim network, there was also a big emphasis on going out of town, going to where the need is great to spread your Torah knowledge to others where they can benefit from it most. I was also raised in the Chafetz Chaim network system. My father is a musmach he got smicha from Chafetz Chaim. And I grew up on the teachings. Our family was very close to the Rosh Hashiva. The Rebbetzin actually was the one who made our shidduch because my husband was actually living in the basement with one of the select few people that when they were in base Medrash, they were, a you know, few people were living in their basement and she got to know my husband very well and thought that it would, it was really good match. Um, she was right. And actually June 29th of this year would have been our 30th wedding anniversary. Um, so we met and basically one of the things we talked about was this whole going out of town thing. I grew up in Queens and I said, sure, out of town sounds great. 
Chicago, Miami, they all sound really nice. And he's like, no, 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 Chicago, Miami, those are like big cities. That's already like second New York. I said, okay, you know, I'll go with you. When the time is right, we'll figure it out. You know, what does out of town mean? So we married and we spent several, nearly 10 years in Kolel. We had five children and my husband got smicha. And there were some challenges along the way, but in the you know, essence of time, I'll just skip along this way of how we ended up in Ottawa. And when it came time to talking about what does out of town mean to me, I had two requirements. Number one is that it had to be within a reasonable drive of the city of New York, where my family was from, and most of them still live. I'm the oldest in my family. I was the first to be married. My sister got married the summer that I moved. So I knew that if I wanted to be part of family simchas, I imagined that you know, teaching is not as lucrative as other fields and with young children, a young family, you know, airplane costs would be expensive and my family as well to be able to um, feel like I was a part of things. I want to be able to know that I could travel back and forth freely. Okay. Second condition was that at the time we had one son and four daughters and I wanted to make sure that there was a girl's high school in the community. Our oldest daughter was only six years old, but I'm the type of person that, um, is kind of a creature of habit. If I like it somewhere, I'm not going anywhere. So I wanted to make sure that if this worked out, we could stay. Um, so with that in mind, we interviewed, we looked at different communities, different communities called us. And you know, to make a long story short, um, the city of Ottawa had several positions available. We went up on a pilot trip and it took us only eight hours in the car to get there. You could leave in the morning and get there in time for Mincha in the afternoon and even in the winter. And um, they had a girls high school. There was also a boys high school, Yeshiva high school, which was also a plus. It was started by Chafetz Chaim. So we figured, okay, you know, worst comes to worst if we had to send our son away for Yeshiva high school, as much as I would probably cry. Um, I figured it's not so unusual for a boy to go away for high school. My husband had done it. Lots of boys do it. We'll cross that bridge. So we, you know, we interviewed in Ottawa. We were enamored by the city. Everyone was so warm and friendly and there was so much room for growth and there was so much growth orientation within the community. And we looked forward to that. That was something that we had really trained for. We had lo really looked forward to doing. And we made the trip. We you know, accepted the job and we moved into the community. And pretty much we felt very much at home in the community. My husband was teaching in the Ottawa Jewish Community School, which at the time was called Hillel Academy, which was the community day school, about 450, 500 kids at the time, pretty big. Um, ran, the students ran the, you know, the spectrum of you know, every, you know, every level of really, uh, religiosity from Shomer Shabbos, handful, to not at all, to some even you know, in interfaith families. And I was teaching at the Torah Academy, which was the school that our kids went to, and I was giving classes for women in the community. And pretty soon our home became an address for the place to be. And we lived in the community where my husband's students lived. And that's exactly where we wanted to be. And we had those students over, you know, every night of Sukkot, there was a Sukkot party. Every night of Hanukkah, there was a Hanukkah party. Every, you know, many Shabbosim, we had Shabbatones for the classes, Shabbatones for individual students, Friday night Shabbat dinners for students with their families, you name it. It was really, it was really- It was a team effort. It was yes. a team effort. <laughs> it was. It was. It was a team effort. The kids were involved also. Um, the kids were in on all the secrets about, you know, how many jelly beans actually were in the jar. They were in on the secret under, you know, which plate had the sticker that you actually got to win the prize. And they really, really looked forward to it. You know, they were proud to be Rabbi Symes' children. We were proud to be Rabbi Symes' family. And he was really making a big impact in the community so much so that he was nominated and won the Grinspoon um, Award for, you know, Teachers Excellence, which is a, you know. It's a, really an extraordinary, an extraordinary acknowledgement. acknowledgement. Yeah. So this all changes on one night and we don't have to get into all the exact details of how that went off the road. But unfortunately, when you were traveling, so this, uh, this accident, which took place, so that changed the course of, of everyone's life. Um, so pretty much, yeah, actually June 20th will be the 12th anniversary of the accident um, coming up pretty soon. Um, June is sometimes a hard month for me. There's a lot of things that might happen in June. Um, my husband's birthday is in June, our anniversary, the anniversary of the accident. 
And that really, I think, separated the before and the after. So whereas everything before the accident, we considered normal, everything after the accident, we considered not normal. Um, basically on the night of the accident, um, most of us got out of the car safe and sound, including myself. I was six months pregnant with our ninth child and we were all taken for observation while my husband was stuck in the car. He said that he couldn't move. He was in a lot of pain. I didn't realize when he said that he couldn't move that he couldn't move. I thought it just meant that, you know, he was stuck because the car was crushed. Um, I assured him that help was on the way and, you know, he'd be getting the help that he needed. And meantime, the rest of us were taken away from the scene to be evacuated. Um, I kept- So just for people who don't know the exact details, this was on a highway that involved avoiding a deer and it was dark and late at night. And so you can imagine the, uh, the difficulty in addressing all the immediate things. So Yehuda is taken to the hospital where they ascertain that that couldn't move is- Right. No. So basically, um, yeah, the accident happened on Highway 81, just before Thousand Islands by Alexandria Bay. And they transported me further south back to where we had come from, to Watertown, New York, to the nearest hospital with, my, with the children. They were divided up into different ambulances, you know, with an older child with younger children and myself in another ambulance. And when I kept questioning the nurse, you know, for information about my husband, um, they kept telling me they didn't have it for me. I kind of, you know, after a while, I was suspecting that they were hiding information from me, um, but I kept nudging them. I kept asking them. And finally, one nurse said to me, we have information. And I said to them, you know, what's what happened? And they said, well, um, he has a spinal cord injury. And at the time, my heart froze because the only thing that I knew about at the time of a spinal cord injury was that a person who has a spinal cord injury is paralyzed. They can't move, they can't walk. So I asked her, can he walk? And, you know, with like a somber expression on her face, she, you know, stared down at the floor and she shook her head and she said, no, no, he can't walk. And at that point, I really had a decision to make because my life was crumbling before me. You know, everything that we had thought our life was seemed to be changing in a flash. If my husband couldn't walk, then what did that mean for our future? What was that going to look like? And I had two choices. Um, choice number one, which seemed like a really, really good option, is that I would just take the pillow, throw it over my head, take the blanket, put that over my head, and just shut down. Just completely block everything out, hibernate, not come out, not talk, not associate with anyone, and just wait for the nightmare to be over. On the other hand, I had my unborn child, my son who was waiting for us at home because he had not come on the trip with us, and seven children on the other side of the curtain in the emergency room. And at that point, I knew that my children were counting on me and I had to do what it takes. And I didn't know what it would take because honestly, I had no idea that being paralyzed just means that someone pushes you around in the wheelchair. I just thought, okay, a person can't walk, you know, otherwise everything else health-wise is intact. Everything else is fine. And you just push them around. But I had no idea. I didn't realize, first of all, just how paralyzed my husband was. His injury was a very high level. It was a C4, C5 injury, which meant that he was paralyzed from the chest down. Um, quadriplegic, all four limbs were affected. Um, he would be reliant on someone for every need for the rest of his life. Um, I was blissfully unaware of that part, um, but the, what I, the parts I did imagine were pretty bad. So I really wanted to shut down, but I had kids on the other side of the curtain. And I said to myself, Shango, you got to do this. There's kids counting on you. You can't shut down. Especially since while we were in the waiting room and waiting to find out news for my husband and waiting to hear what was going on, the kids were all checked out. And one daughter kept coming in and say, mommy, mommy, is Abba going to die? And I looked at her and I could not imagine why she was asking me that. This was before I even knew he was paralyzed. I said to her, Asna, is Abba gonna die? What do you mean? We were all talking to him. He was just alive as me and you. Why would he die? And she's like, I don't believe you, mommy. I don't believe you. And I think I didn't realize just how injured he was because I myself was in shock. And I knew that I had my kids counting on me and I owed it to them to 
get a grip on myself and pull up those bootstraps and figure out what this meant. So now we take this further after Yehuda Zechor Lavracha gets out of the hospital and in a Herculean fashion with an unbelievable support system, an incredible the team of doctors and nurses and family members and everybody comes back to Ottawa and he begins a new type of hashpa, a new type of inspiration, uh, which maybe you could share with us a little bit because it kind of took two forms, right? It took the form of what he did and how he taught and how he interacted with people, but also that blog, The Rolling Rabbis. So maybe talk for a moment and share with us a little bit behind the curtain of how those both came to be about the interactions that he had and also his writing. Okay, so um, the initial stage of hospitalization was um, five weeks in Syracuse Trauma Center, at which time he was airlifted back to Ottawa to further his treatment. And he um, was, at that time, he was totally in the ICU for three months before he could go to rehab center. He was an inpatient rehab for six months before he was able to come home. So he didn't end up coming home until just before Pesach of like about April of 2011. So it was nearly, you know, nine months or so of being away from home. And over that time, there were lots of tears shed, lots of crying, lots of trying to understand, what do I do now? And the whole time, Yehuda kept saying, before I thought I knew what Hashem wanted from me, before I knew or I thought I knew what it meant to be an Ever Hashem, what it meant to serve Hashem, I thought that my expertise, I thought that my capabilities were in teaching in the classroom, in getting up in front of students, singing with them, inviting them, engaging them, tailoring tests to their needs, having conversations with them, answering their questions, knowing that their teacher was there for them. And now he's stuck in this frozen body. His body can't move on command. How am I gonna be an Eved Hashem? How am I gonna serve Hashem? What is my purpose now? What does Hashem want from me? And that was something that he always said. I don't ask why this happened, but I ask what? What does Hashem want of me now? And that was how he handled all of his act interactions with the staff in the hospital, with the staff in the rehab center. And he always made it clear that he was a believer in Hashem. He trusted in Hashem, whether or not he understood what Hashem's plan was. He recognized that there must be a plan, but we're just not you know, able to understand what it is right now. And that you know, after speaking with our rabbis and speaking with our mentors, we had to wait to see what unfolded. And we'd have to wait to see what this new plan was. And even in the rehab center, it was before he was discharged, he had to give a speech as part of his speech therapy, you know, um, you know um, exit ceremony. He had to give a speech. He had to be able to talk for a certain amount of time. And I remember the speech therapist was very nervous about him because he didn't take notes and nobody was writing for him. And what was he going to say? And how was he going to prepare his speech? And he's like, I've got this. You know, I might be, not be able to write, but I'm a born teacher. I know what to say. He didn't need to like prepare in that sense of the word. And his parting message to the staff at the rehab center, who this was their, you know, our six months there was their first time that they ever met a rabbi. It was their first time interacting with a religious family. You know, nine children, our extended family members who came from far and wide to spend time with us so we would never be alone. People who came with him every single day to put tefillin on him to the point where our son's bris was held in the rehab center to the point of they allowed a sukkah to be built on the balcony, to the point of we were allowed to light the Hanukkah menorah in the blue room. They called it the blue room. We called it the Shabbos room because we spent Shabbosim there. And they saw that there was a glimpse, that there was a godliness to him. And they, he said how he believes in a higher purpose. And he told these people that he met in the rehab center how, you know, just like the story of Rabbi Akiva, who, always, you know, who said, Gamzu Latova, this is for the best. And just whatever Hashem does is for the best. That is what he is seeing from this. And even though it might not feel good, it is good. And I think that was the start of his new audience, was being able to relate to people from all walks of life, people from all religious backgrounds, non-religious to non-believers, and open their eyes to what it means to be a believer. And as that happened, he became 
like a symbol of, as the book says, a symbol of perseverance. Somebody who had the odds stacked high against him. This is a man who literally couldn't do anything on his own. The most he could do was, you know, shrug his shoulders. It took months for him to be able to raise his hand to his chin and months more for him to able to finally be able to raise his hand to his eyes to be able to say Shema on his own without having someone take his arm and put it by his, by his face for him. And how he exemplified to keep on going and to never give up. And there were lots of setbacks. Anytime he had an infection, every time he had a fever, it was one step forward. I'd say two steps back, but it wasn't, it was more. And he'd push up and restart and push up and restart. And he tried to go back to the classroom. He did a few times here and there when his health was able, but it was hard to get out of the house. It was hard for him to have the stamina to keep it up as routine basis. And that is when a very close friend of ours who's actually son was one of you just close students. We used to have him over for Shabbos all the time. You know, um, Shelly Harris was, you know, heard about, you know, you wanting to do something and teach and going to the classroom was too hard. And it was she who said, you know, I like cooking. I have a cooking blog. What if I set you up with a blog? And, you know, we weren't so techy at the time. We were like, what's a blog? <laughs> How do you write a blog? What do you do? Like, what do you need? And she explained the ins and the outs and she created a site for him, Rolling Rabbi. That's what he called himself. He said, because I'm a rabbi on wheels and because I roll with the punches. And I think that was where we started to realize, whereas before the accident, the classroom was his audience. After the accident, the world became his audience. And I could actually go on the inside on the stats and see all the countries that have hits on the blog. And it's really everywhere. So you talked about the way that he interacted as a teachable experience for so many people and what he was writing. For many of us who were davening for him over this period, we felt like we were connected with him, even if we had never met him in person, whether we would hear updates through family members who were here or hearing things through what was going on the blog. So this kind of network, it's incredible, really. I wonder if that's one of the Rabboni Shalom's gifts of technology to able to all of us to appreciate the perseverance and the model of Emuna in such a powerful way. In, in the book, toward the beginning, you have a little piece from the diary, a letter that he had written to his aunt and uncle in, in the late 1980s about his own mother who was not well at that time with Alzheimer's and talking about how uh, asking why presumes that we, can, we are in control. So his focus on asking what enabled him to be really focused on you know, sharing his message and how inspiring that is. The, part of the book is a little bit um, of the personal perspective. You know, maybe you want to share just a moment, whether it's a, whether it's an anniversary story or something uh, personal that that you could share about what it was like being at home with the kids, experiencing this real uh, in you know in that period of the ups and downs. Okay. Um... So there were lots of ups and downs and it was kind of like living, waiting for the other shoe to drop because as much as, you know, he was well, when he was well, he wasn't well. <laughs> um, so it was kind of learning how to adjust to new normals, learning how to readjust when circumstances changed and how we had to become really um, fluid and spontaneous and really live in the present. And I think one of the things that he taught me was to really live in the present and to really appreciate the time that we have now. And he, I think that since the accident, we found that the joys are more joyous and the sorrows we can feel. But I think it's that tapping into that raw emotion that allows you to feel that entire spectrum of emotions. Um, so just, you know, a touching story that comes to mind, you know, despite all this chaos and despite, you know, never knowing, you know, when he would land in the hospital next, um, he always looked out for me and he always wanted to celebrate our anniversaries, birthdays, whatever it was. So on one anniversary, which um, I knew our anniversary was coming up, 
He told me he had a surprise for me. He said all he needed from me was to dress up and he'd give me an address of where I should drive him to. I we love had, this story. This is right? the best. It's a good one. <laughs> we had an accessible van, which not, you know, with, with a lot of drama of its own of how we got the van and the issues that the van caused us. Um, but that's, you could read about that in the story, um, in the book. And he gave me an address. It was the Casino de Lac Lumi. It's in Quebec. Ottawa is just across the bridge from Quebec. And it was the casino. I was like, you don't, we don't gamble. <laughs> what are we going to be doing there? He's like, trust me, just follow the directions and we're going to go. So I'm the type of person I don't like to drive when I don't know where I'm going. I like to know how I'm getting there. I like to know why I'm going to be there. I'd like to give myself time to be there, but as we used to say, things run on quadriplegic time. You know, his thought was, we'll get there when we get there. Okay, so we get to the casino and he says, okay, we're supposed to report to the front desk. So we get up and he, you know, we, you know, he wheels in to the front desk. I follow him and he says, hi, you know, I'm here to see. And he says some name of, I guess, some manager. He says, okay, no problem, sir. Follow up, follow me. And he takes us up into the elevator to a boardroom, someplace in the recesses of this, you know, casino slash hotel. And we get to the door and he tells me, knock on the door. I said, what's going to be over there? He's like, just knock on the door. So I knock on the door. I hear, come in. And as I open the door, I hear music serenading us. We have very close friends who are professional musicians. And they play the harp, they play the cello, they play all kinds of musical instruments. And he had given them a playlist of all of our favorite songs, including the songs that we walked down to at our wedding. And we had our own private, our own private concert. And it was very heartwarming because I know that it took a lot of effort for him to arrange that. Obviously it was with the help of friends. So yeah, that was kind of hard knowing that, you know, your friends know your secret anniversary. But that was something that was, you know, also took getting used to, you know, including others into our inner sphere to enable us to still, you know, have a relationship that we wanted. Um, but it was his effort that made me realize that as one of the times that made me realize that as much as things are different, things are still very much the same. And I still felt like I had him. He was still there. His mind was still there. He, you know, I would promise him that as far as I was concerned, he was still him. I still had him. I still had my husband. My kids still had their father. He was limited in what he could do physically, but emotionally, mentally, and with talking, there was still so much that he could offer. And we relished that. And that was something that we, we really treasured. So it's, it's a beautiful description of how he was so thoughtful and considerate and, and wanted to give to you and whether it's the concert or having someone come and do a painting, you know, these are amazing stories that, that just give us some insight into the kind of generous and thoughtful and beautiful person that he was. And even though, you know, his journey in this world ended on a cold morning in February in 2017, but that, that concept of being an inspiration of someone who cares about others, who thinks about others, who's a devoted a uh, servant of the Rabboni Shalom and with it, literally every element, that's something that lives on. So you talked about letting others into that little circle. So the kids are part of this little circle and how did they feel? Let's take a step back. How did they feel about other people getting into the circle or even more when you were talking to them, I assume at some point saying, I think I'm going to write a book about our family and, and Ava and me and all that. How did the kids feel about this intrusion, so to speak, of letting other people in to your life and the book? Um, so I think there's two kinds of intrusions, the wanted intrusion and the not wanted intrusion, right? So the caregivers and the, you know, auxiliary staff, I consider to be the unwanted um, intrusions um, because as much as we needed them and as much as I knew we had to have them, it was painful for me to have them. It was painful for me to have them in my home. And as much as I almost got used to them being there, I, and I learned how to ignore them, there were some that um, didn't know how to be ignored, shall we say. Like there were some that were a little bit more 
too present sometimes than they needed to be. I got along best with those that just, you know, like the old motto, kids should be seen and not heard. Caregivers should be seen and not heard. Just stay downstairs. If I'm with Rabbi now, I'll let you know if he needs you. If I'm not home, you're needed. Um, so it was kind of finding that balance between wanting to maintain a husband-wife relationship and me not being only his caretaker, caregiver, that we had to allow other people in our home. And as he got better, um, we were able to remove some of that care. And then as you know, his condition deteriorated, we had to bring in more care, you know, as the case may be. Um, I think that the kids were more forgiving than I with most of the caregivers. They didn't see it as a personal um, invasion as much as I did. Um, well, that's because they weren't married, so they don't right. know what it means to have a husband and a wife relationship. So true. it's a different story. <laughs> it's true, but they did still resent when, you know, certain caregivers like tried to take over sometimes or tried to give their opinions and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so those were the, you know, the ones that you, you know, can't live with, can't live without kind of people. Um, and we did, we were fortunate that we did have some very good ones that, you know, that we were thankful for and others that, you know, they have a chapter devoted to them in the book, the ones that we, you know, we're trying to forget, but we can't. Um, as opposed to the book, which when we talked about it was a source of pride for them. And it was something that they wanted to share with the world. And it was something that they recognized and it gave them strength to know that their father was somebody who other people recognized was somebody special. And originally when we talked about the book, I, you know, I was pretty open with them as we were the whole time. And I think that is why, that was one of the main reasons, one ways that they were able to, um, I guess, blend and merge over, you know, the, the, I guess now 12 years since the accident was that openness and that communication of them knowing what was going on, them being up to date. They didn't have to, you know, stand behind doors to hear what was happening, listen in on phone conversations. We were pretty frank with them. We were pretty open with them while at the same time maintaining that balance of privacy, but they knew what was going on. They knew what condition their father was in. They knew they knew when they needn't be scared and they knew when they should. So there wasn't that like alarming thing. And mostly we wanted them to be children. We didn't want to rob them of their childhood and we wanted children to be children. And that's how we, you know, we dealt with the whole situation. So they wanted others to know and to hear and to see about what they were proud of about their father. And I assured them that in the book, while they would need to be mentioned in the book, it wouldn't be an expose about the kids. Like they would be a peripheral. They would be obviously mentioned in the story and they did get to read everything before. You know, they got to, you know, have any veto power if they wanted and just that they knew that what was going in and they wouldn't get surprised by people on the street. Well, it's certainly a beautiful part of the book. And one of the things that you'll see in the book are some great pictures and photographs of Yehuda Zechon Levracha with the kids and smiling and doing fun things and trying clearly trying to make them, uh, you know, feel that love from him and to experience those childhood experiences. And I'm sure each kid, every child at their age, you know, the ch children who got married when he was, you know, not doing so well. And then the children who are younger, everybody had a different experience of how they related to him and to you during that whole period. I think one of the most telling um, thoughts about this was my son, who's now 16, it was a couple of years ago, he had gone away to sleepaway camp and he came home from camp and he was talking about one of the kids in his bunk who had some kind of troublesome family background story, you know, a hardship in, you know, the family relationship. And I was just listening to him and I was a little bit thrown off guard. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to respond to it, just listen, or if I was supposed to say anything. And if I was supposed to say something, what the smart thing was to say at that point. So as I mulled that over in my head, he said, you know, Ma, he has it harder than me because even though Abba died, I know that Abba loved me. And I was, that was, he couldn't have summed it up better. I said, Yitzchak, you are so right. And I'm so glad that you know that Abba did love you and he still does. And that gave me comfort to know that 
they'll treasure that. And sadly, he's not here to see them grow and he's not here to see them develop. And that was something that gave him so much joy and so much nachas to be raising his children. He was so proud of them. But for a child who was 11 when his father passed away to know that so strongly, that really warms me and that gives me encouragement that, you know, we were doing something right. So this conversation is sharing many important lessons for me and for all of us about the importance of being present and experiencing the emotions, emotions in the moment and making sure to tell our children and not just tell them, but make sure that the children know and know deeply that we love them and that we care about them and they'll out, always carry that with them. What are some of the lessons that have kept you going and that you've wanted to project and educate all of us through the book? Um, so from my end, there are two things that kept me going. And these two things, you know, I could say them now with a lot of conviction and you could wake me up in my sleep and I'd probably be able to parrot it. It took me a long time to understand it and really feel it into the depths of I'm feeling it now. But it was something that resonated with me. And over time, I've since, you know, reiterated to myself and re-strengthened within myself. Um, and number, here's two of them. Number one, um, I was at a speech. A friend of mine had schlepped me to hear some video speech at the beginning of our journey about, you know, coping in challenging times. And, you know, I said to her, Rachel, I said, you really got to be kidding me. If I'm going to get out of the house, that's not what I'm going to hear. I don't need to hear a speech about coping in challenging times. I am the speech for coping and chal for challenging times. Forget the coping. You know, I, that's just <laughs> get out of the house. That's not what it's going to be. You know, and she's like, no, no, go, 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 go. So she schleps me to this speech. I resign myself to being bored. I resign myself. Okay, maybe I can, you know, take a nap while the lights are out or something because it was a video recording. And the lights dim, you know, everyone's sitting in their seats and I'm like, here we go. I'm stuck here for an hour, you know, and there's, and at one point, the, one of the speakers um, comes up onto screen and she said something which, to be honest, is not new. And what I'm sharing with you, many of you have probably heard before, as I have. I think though it was the way it was said and also the timing. And I think ultimately the lessons that hit home the most are about the timing. We could hear things being said. We could hear the same speech, you know, before Rosh Hashanah, where there are certain Dvar Torahs that we always hear before Pesach, and you know, like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like, you could almost, you know, you could almost imagine it, right? Before Sefirah, so Omer, you know that as soon as Pesach is over, there's going to be a flyer. Don't just count the days, make the days count. You know, like, things like that, that have become, you know, almost cliche. So this lady gets up there and she says, before you are born, your nishama, your soul, is shown a video, so to speak, of what your life here on earth, what your mission is in this world, and everything that you are going to do and that is going to happen to you from the moment you are born until the moment you depart this world. And you are going to be looking at that screen and you're going to be seeing everything, whether good or bad, hard or easy, you know, complicated, easy, challenging, beyond challenging, you know, the, the fun stuff, all of it. And your neshama is going to be shaking the head and nodding. Yeah, I agree. I agree to that. Because up there, when your neshama is just surrounded by Hashem and surrounded by spirituality, and it's not twisted or, um, or being torn by making decisions, you know, having choices to make and seeing things that which appear exciting, which appear better. And without all of those distractions, the soul knows that its mission here on earth is to become the best soul of that person that it could be. And when it sees all those things happening, it understands that those things need to happen to it because that's what's best for it to ultimately become the best that it could be so that when it returns to its maker, it has achieved perfection. And when I heard that, it sent shivers up my spine because I, this had been months after the accident and I had been telling people, I did not sign up for this. I did not sign up for this. This is not on my bucket list. This was not on my list of things to do. This was not where I saw my life headed. You know, you know, go to school, check. Get a degree, check. Get married, check. Have children, check. Move out of town, check. We got them. 
being the wife of a quadriplegic wasn't one of them. And I kept saying, I'm a teacher. I'm on the other side of the desk. It's my students who always say, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me, you know, if they want to do something, if they want an honor or a privilege or, you know, to answer a question in class. And I was telling people for months, I did not say, pick me, pick me, pick me. And when I heard this lady on the screen, I said to myself, I did. I did sign up for this. All these months, I was wrong. I thought I didn't sign up for this, but I did. And I sat there. I did not know that the video ended. I did not know that the lights were on. I did not realize that every people, every, you know, all the other people had left. Next thing I knew it, I was home. I even called my friend recently when I was writing the book and I said, Rachel, how did I get home? I just remember sitting in my seat frozen. She goes, what do you think? I left you there? I said, well, I don't remember anything after that. And really, like it just penetrated so deep inside of me where I said, I signed up for this. By golly, if I signed up for this, then this is not something that happened to me. This is something that I had chose. And if I chose this, then that means I have ability to make the decisions. I have, I can rise to the occasion. I have power over this quadriplegia thing. We always talked about beating this quadriplegia thing, you know, like poof in your face, you know, we're going to like, so what, you know, and that's when it hit me that I signed up for this and that at some point in time before I recognized it, and when I was put into this world as Shandell Symes, I recognized that this was part of Shandell Symes becoming the best Shandell Symes that she could be. And I needed that to make that happen. And now I'm telling it to you, and it sounds beautiful. I'm telling you at the time, I didn't believe it as much as I said it now. It took a lot of tears, a lot of tribulation, a lot of thought to actually let it penetrate. I signed up for this. This is what I need. This is my role now, and this is wow. where it's supposed to be. So that was one. <laughs> All right, let's hear the other one before it gets um, too late. One more? Okay, yeah. one more. Um, one more. I was had the same you know, tingling feeling in my spine one day when I was preparing for teaching. Um, I was teaching the Parsha of the Eschanan when Moshe Rabbeinu is davening and beseeching Hashem for over 500 times to go into Eretz Israel to lead the Jewish people into Israel. And in fact, he even says, if I can't lead them into Israel, then at least let me go into Israel. Because I know and I understand the value of the mitzvah. I know and understand the value of a mitzvah that is done in Israel. There are mitzvahs that I can't do anywhere else that I can only do in Israel. I want to go. I want to experience that because that would be sublime. That would be the best. And he's praying and he's praying. And Hashem says to him, Moshe, Rav Licha, enough for you. It's enough. And Rashi says, Rav Tov Hatzafun Lecha, I have something better that's hidden for you. And when I read that, I said to myself, I have something better that's hidden for you. Moshe is telling Hashem, I know what I want. I know what I need. I need to go into Israel. And Hashem is saying, no, I have something better for you. You think you know what you need, but I have something better for you. And again, those words were just swimming around in my head. I have something better for you. Shaindel, you thought you knew what your life should be like. You thought you planned out the script of what your life should look like. But Hashem said, I have something better for you. It's not the way it's going to look because I know more than you what you need. And again, that's something that, you know, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of work and a lot of tears. But it's on a magnet on my fridge and it's there to remind me. Well, we certainly appreciate you opening up and sharing these beautiful and inspiring and meaningful and deep and powerful messages with us. And, you know, everybody has their own path and their own challenges and their own nakudos, but we can all tap into these messages to wherever we are at those junctures in our lives and be inspired and be strengthened. And your realness and openness and genuineness enables us to do that. So we thank you for the time tonight. We thank you for sharing the stories in this beautiful book. For those who would like an opportunity to get to know a glimpse of this extraordinary machanech human being, father, educator, inspirational person, Rabbi Yehuda Symes, this is the book to pick up, Rolling Rabbi, The Power of Perseverance, the story of Rabbi Yehuda Symes. It's published by Israel Bookshop. You can get it 
online, you can get in a local brick and mortar. It's just a way to continue this journey to read about the life of you know, somebody who on the one hand was extraordinary, on the other hand was in certain sense, as you would say, right, very ordinary. And he wanted himself to be ordinary. And these lessons, these ideas are from regular people who accomplished really things that are beyond what most of us could imagine. So we bless you and your father and your children. Arichus Yamin, Gesint, Nachas, Besuras Tovos, Simchas, and the opportunity to connect with us and give us chizuk and share chizuk and hopefully continue this journey for many good years in good health. So thank mm -hmm. you so, so much for joining us right thank here you. in Chicago. Thank you so much for having me. And really, it, it's meaningful and it should be as a chizuk for neshama, as neshama should have an aliyah. And any messages that, you know, speak to you, resonate with you. I thank you for taking the time to listen.